Hey everyone, how are we doing today? This is James Sweeney, aka Split Suit, and welcome back to another video. In this video, I want to talk all about hand classifications. And I think hand classifications are very important. I think a lot of people tend to underutilize them or not fully understand what they are and how to use them. So in this video, I want to talk about the four hand classifications that I use, how I use them, and how I can use them post-flop when thinking about default lines, then also thinking about deviating from default lines as well. So this video is going to be pretty jam-packed. It's going to be a very important video if you've never worked with hand classifications before or never really thought about implementing this kind of framework in your post-flop. So this video is going to be very, very helpful for those of you who have never worked with it before. And if you have, it might clarify some things as well. So without further ado, we're just going to jump right into it, start having some fun, and talk about hand classifications. So the four hand classifications that I use would be bluff, semi-bluff, value, and showdown value. So I just use four hand classifications. And my main goal when I get post-flop is to really figure out what kind of hand classification I have. Because once I know, I usually have a general idea on how I want to play those hands. So if I have a bluff hand, I kind of know what I want to do with it. If I have a value hand, I kind of know what I want to do with it. And it's important that I can quickly get into a situation, classify my hand strength, and be able to play it as best as possible. Now, there's one big thing that you want to remember with hand classifications is that they are relative. So what might be a value hand against a fish might actually be a showdown value hand against a good player. And what might be a semi-bluff against one player might be something else against another. So it's important that we at least remember that. And the different kind of factors that go into how relative a hand class is, is who the villain is, what kind of texture we're dealing with as far as the flop turn river are concerned history and dynamic and all that sort of fun stuff. So let's actually start working with bluff hands first, start talking about how to recognize them and what our general plays with bluff hands are, and then go from there. All right, so let's look at this hand, one where we raise with queen nine suited, end up getting called by the big blind, go heads up, and completely miss this flop. So at this point, if I'm classifying my hand, I'm simply gonna say that my hand is probably a bluff. And what I mean by a bluff is that when I'm bet, the big thing that I'm hoping my opponent does is fold. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to fold out better hands, or I'm just trying to fold out everything essentially, and go forward from there. Very, very simple. So in an ideal world, if I could bet here and get folds from things like pocket sixes and pocket fours and ace queen and ace jack, that would be a good thing. So when I'm bluffing, again, I'm looking for folds. So when my default line with a bluff when I class on my hand as a bluff is okay, if I can generate enough folds, I'm going to go for it. If I can't generate enough folds, probably not going to go for it as a pure, pure default. And it's that level of simple. So in this situation, I obviously have a bluff, very simple to see. And if I bet, it's because I think my opponent's going to fold enough of the time, either now or later, and I go forward from there. So bluffs are very, very simple. They're very simple to see. And it's very simple to figure out what you want to do with them. Again, usually betting if you think you can generate enough folds, and usually not if you don't think you can get enough folds from your opponent. Let's look at a situation like this, where we steal with fours, get called by the big, go heads up, he checks. So in this particular situation, I'm classifying my hand strength, and I'd probably say that I have a bluff, because I have fourth pair. And the big thing when I have a bluff is I'm saying, okay, what am I really hoping that my opponent does? If my opponent check calls me here, I'm not really happy about that because he's either check calling with a hand that beats me, something like ace x or queen x, or he does it with something that has like a massive chunk of equity, say like a jack 10 type hand. So if my opponent check calls, I'm really not happy. I'm not generating any value most of the time. And also if my opponent check raises me, I'm not really happy. So when I'm bluffing again, my major focus is, is my opponent going to be doing a lot of check folding? If so, I'm probably going to go for the stab and try to pick it up. If I don't think my opponent is going to do a lot of check folding, eh, then I'm probably a little bit more likely just to say forget it and not really burn any money at him, especially if he's not going to be folding. The next hand class we have is the semi-bluff. So let's just look at a spot like this where we open, get called by the small, go heads up, he checks. So at this point, I'll classify my hand as a semi-bluff. So the difference between a semi-bluff and a bluff is that with a semi-bluff, we have a chunk of equity that we can actualize. So with a bluff, we're obviously just hoping that our opponent folds. With a semi-bluff, 
yes, we still want our opponent to fold, but if he doesn't, it's not always the worst thing in the world, because at least we have some equity we can actualize. And a summon bluff could be anything from this kind of mega thing where we have two overcards and a flush draw. It could just be a gut shot. It could be an overcard with a gut shot or a straight draw. It could be a whole bunch of different things. And of course, not all semi bluffs are created equal, as there's a big difference between something like this with two overcards and a flush draw versus just a single gut shot. So definitely make sure that you're keeping that in mind. And obviously, the more equity you have, the less you mind, per se, if your opponent calls as opposed to folds. So in this particular situation, when I have this much equity, I have this kind of hand, usually I'm just going to go for a bet and go from there. And this is a situation where I don't hate if my opponent check folds, because all I have at this point is just ace high. I don't really mind if my opponent check calls, because I do have a fair chunk of equity I can actualize with two cards to come, and position especially. And then if my opponent check raises, which is my least favorite of his options, I'm not particularly happy about it, but by the same token, I'll just play poker, I'll make a math decision when I see it, and I'll just go forward from there. So it's very, very simple, and that's just my general outlook when I have things like semi-bluffs. It's just simply, I don't mind folds, but by the same token, if my opponent happens to call and I do have this fair chunk of equity, I'll just play poker better than he does on the turn and riv, make better decisions, and go forward from there. So again, with a semi-bluff, yes, I still am in kind of a bluff mode where I don't mind folds, but again, with the extra equity, and we always love equity, I may, it could change how much I hate if my opponent calls or doesn't call. Let's look at another situation, one where we decide to steal with 9-7 suited, get called by the button, catch this, and at this point, I would still say that I have a semi-bluff, although definitely not nearly as much equity as I did in the hand before, because in this situation, all I really have is a gut shot with a backdoor flush draw. So not nearly as much equity as, say, two overcards and a flush draw. So because I have less equity in this situation, again, my focus is going to be more on the fold side. I really, The less equity I have, the more folds that I want, ideally. So in this particular situation, I would bet this if I thought that my opponent could find the fold button enough, if a lot of his range was bricking and I thought he would fold it, all that sort of stuff. Because when I bet this, unless I have some ideas on how I can make good double or triple barrels, chances are I'm just going to want to be kind of pot shot bluffing this, just go for the single stab and hoping that my opponent folds enough of the time. But if he calls, at least I do have a slim chunk of equity with just that gut shot and again that backdoor flush draw. So he does decide to call, catch an 8 on the turn, and we notice that at this point our hand shifted from a semi-bluff on the flop to all of a sudden value on the turn with that strong straight. So at this point, I'm just going to play how I play value hands. If I thought I could go for a check raise, I would. If not, then I'll probably just keep betting myself and just kind of bet all the way down strictly, strictly for value. So this is kind of the way that I play semi-bluffs. I usually, the less equity that I have with them, I'm just going to be kind of pot shotting on flops and stuff. If I think it's a good double or triple barrel spot, I'll consider it. But majority of the time, playing a little bit more cautious, kind of playing more pot shotty as opposed to get in there and throwing out massive bluffs for no real reason. And then when I do end up actualizing my chunk of equity, usually I'm being very aggressive. I'm kind of in a value mode at that point. I'm trying to get the most amount of value possible. But if I thought that my best value strategy at that point would have been to check raise the turn, like I said, that's totally valid if you think that that's the best play. So this is kind of just the way I think about semi-bluffs is, again, how much equity do I have? How fold-oriented am I? Do I really want folds right now? Do I think I can generate enough folds to make this bet profitable? And then if I do end up binking it and improving on my equity, then again, usually shifting into a value mode where I'm thinking about how can I get the biggest pop possible with my very strong hand. The next hand class we have would be a value hand. And a value hand is usually a hand that is very easy to see. It's usually very strong in nature. It could be something as strong as a full house. It could just be top pair, top kicker. It could even be top pair, medium kicker in certain situations. But usually with a value hand, we feel very confident in our hand. And my default action with a value hand is simply going to be to bet. I think I have the best hand a very, very large chunk of the time. I think that my opponent is going to continue with worse. And as a default, my action is going to be to bet. Of course, I can go for check raises. Of course, I can go for other plays. But as a default, my value thought process is going to be, let's try to make a big hand, I'm sorry, a big pot with this big hand and go forward from there. So if we had a situation like this where we raise sixes, get called by the cutoff, go heads up and catch a set, 
obviously at this point we would pretty much everyone be in agreement that this is a value hand. We have a very strong hand. Any hand that my opponent continues with, chances are I'm going to beat it. Really, only a couple hands beat me at this point, pocket eights and pocket aces. So at this point, it's pretty likely that I have the best hand. Anything that my opponent continues with, whether, whether it be a sex, whether it be a flush draw, whether it be a straight draw, whatever, I beat. So I'm definitely in a value mode right now. And again, when I have a value mode, usually my thought process is going to be to bet and just try to generate value. So it doesn't, again, it doesn't mean that I would never check raise the flop, but if I don't really know what to do, I have a value hand. My thought process with a value hand is the default should be to bet, and I go from there. Five on the turn, again, same thing. I'm just asking myself, what do I have? Right now I have a value hand. Is my opponent going to continue with second best hands? If yes, I'm probably going to continue betting. If I thought that I could go for a profitable check raise, I would. But again, as a default, probably just going to go for big bets all the way down. And then also take a note on my opponent, whatever he has. So I would take a note that he didn't three bet an EP open with ace king, that he couldn't full top pair top kicker, blah, blah, blah. So again, this is a value hand. This is how I think about a value hand. And again, it's very simple. It's easy to find it. And it's also pretty easy to figure out what the best line is. Generally, again, as a default, just betting value hands. One of the most confusing things when we're going post-flop is to classify things like top pair, top kicker, top pair, mediocre kicker, top pair, second kicker, those kind of hands. And it's difficult so we don't really know if it's value or if it's shifting closer to showdown value, which we're going to talk about later in the video. So let's actually just go through an example and talk a little bit about it. So in this particular situation, we raise ace-king from the cutoff, get called by the big, go heads up, and he checks. So against most players, I'm going to assume that this is going to be a value hand. And again, I think it's value because I think the range that my opponent would check call or check raise with would be favorable to me. I think that he would continue with worse aces, maybe some 10x, flush draws, gut shots, maybe he'll peel it and try to stab off and turn. Something like that. So I think he's going to continue with second best hands. Now obviously depending on who the big blind is could change my opinion on that. So if the big blind is a stupid fish, well fish are going to continue with a whole slew of second best hands. Things like pocket nines and pocket eights and flush draws and gut shots with four or five and all sorts of silly random nonsense. And because of that, a fish is going to continue with a bunch of second best stuff. And if he is a fish, then I'm way more likely to say, okay, this hand, top pair, top kicker, is probably way closer to pure, pure value. And because of that, I'm definitely just going to go for bets strictly, strictly for value. Now, if the big blind were somebody else, say like a nid or a tag, who I didn't think had a bunch of second best stuff in his range, or wouldn't make enough calling mistakes, well, that could change my opinion. But again, against most players, I'm going to assume that this is going to be value, and I'm kind of just going to go for bets and obviously make decisions based on how the turn and river roll off. You know, if a really bad card comes off that maybe shifts my range or shifts the way that I classify my hand, that's going to make me change my line for sure. So in this situation, I'm just going to assume that the big blind is a fish. And because of that, when I assume the big blind is a fish, I am pretty much just strictly in value mode. Now, big blind being a fish actually means that he could have something with a three in it, but whatever. By that token, he can have a bunch of things with a 10 in it, with a worse ace in it, with flush draws, with gut shots, with all sorts of silly stuff. So against a fish, I really am almost always shifting my top pair top kickers or my top pair good kickers really into a value side, especially when I'm thinking that most fish would probably even three bet things like ace king and ace queen. So I'm really putting my hands strictly in the value side of the spectrum and really just kind of going to go for bets all the way down. Now, if I face a raise somewhere, obviously I'm going to re class for my hand strength if I think that he would only check raise say hands that beat me but in a situation where big blind I'm saying he's a fish I'm probably just going to bet all the way down and definitely take a note on whatever the heck he turns up with if he calls me three streets with something like 10-9 I need to know that so I know to never ever miss a value bet against him in the future and know that I can start classifying some of my quote-unquote weaker value hands more towards just pure value because he's going to be showing up with so many second best hands that I can generate value from. So hopefully that kind of gives you a little heads up as to how you want to be thinking about things like top pair, top kicker. Again, think about your opponent. Think about the range of hands he's likely to continue with if you do go for that value bet and making sure that you're staying in the value mode. Now just because you have something like 
a value hand doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to go for three streets of value. Maybe your opponent won't allow that. Maybe your opponent won't call the turn with the second best hand. But we'll talk about that when we get into showdown value hands. Actually, since we're talking about showdown value hands a little bit, let's just define a showdown value hand. So a showdown value hand is a hand that we expect is probably best a fair chunk of the time, but that we don't really want to generate a massively huge pot. We really don't think that the bets are going to be accomplishing a tremendous amount. Because remember, if we could bet and get called by a bunch of second best hands, chances are we have more of a value hand. If our bet really didn't accomplish anything, but we expect to win a decent amount at showdown, down, then we would have something closer to showdown value. So let's just look at an example and kind of talk about it. So let's take a situation like this where MP1 raises, we decide to 3-bet with Ace-3, which we'll just say is a kind of a semi-bluff or a bluff 3-bet preflop. He calls, he checks. So at this point I'm trying to classify my hand strength and figure out exactly what I have. So the big litmus test that I would use to figure out if I have a value hand or a showdown value hand is to say, okay, if I bet, can I name at least three worse hands that would always continue? And if so, it's probably, my hand is probably closer to value. If not, my hand is probably closer to showdown value. Legit, that simple. So in this particular situation, I say, okay, can I name at least three worse hands that would continue? Do I see MP1 check calling here with kings, queens, jacks every single time? Mm, maybe, maybe not, depends on who he is. Um, obviously he's never going to check fold a better hand, he's never going to check fold somebody like pocket tens, pocket aces, or ace king, so I'm not folding out any better hands, so that's not really good. So I'm obviously not bluffing here. And in this particular situation, I can't really name a bunch of hands that would make mistakes if I bet here with value in mind. So because of that, I don't think my hand really has value at this particular stage. I think it's more showdown value. I don't think the bet really accomplishes anything. Whereas a lot of people would just bet here because, oh my god, I has top pair. But whenever we bet, we need to have more reason than just I have top pair. It needs to be I have a hand that I deem as value because the kind of range that my opponent would continue with would be a lot of second best stuff, and thus my bet is more for value. That's an actual thought process, not just I have top pair. So in this particular spot, there's really nothing wrong with checking here. And again, your check here could do a bunch of things on the flop. It could get your opponent to bluff the turn, which creates value for us. It could get him to check call lighter on the turn with that kings, queens, jacks type range where he reads your flop check as weakness and all of a sudden wants to try to pick it off with a check call on the turn. So there's a bunch of good things that can happen by checking, and you also minimize loss when you're behind. So if your opponent already has, say, pocket tens or ace king, the check behind on the flop is definitely going to limit our loss, which is something that we always want to be thinking about. So in this particular spot, if he checks the turn, I'm probably just going to bet for value here, try to get looked up by kings, queens, jacks with a spade, maybe the cry call that of that particular range. I think that if he had something like Ace King, he'd probably bet it himself on a turn, so his check really turns his range a little more face up. And also if he were going to bluff, he probably would have bluffed the turn, so he probably doesn't have any interest in bluffing. So in this particular spot he does check call, and on the Riv, I ask myself the same question. If I'm betting for value, can I name at least three worse hands that would continue? At this point, probably not. He's probably not going to call two streets with kings, queens, or jacks. If you thought that he would, well, maybe you're more in a value mode. If you don't think that he ever would, then you're probably more in a showdown value mode, so I would just check behind, take a note on whatever he had, and go forward from there. So if you kind of just use that little litmus test that if I'm betting for value, can I name at least three worse hands that would continue, and also if I'm betting as a bluff, can I name at least three better hands that would fold, that usually gets you in the thought process thinking, okay, is this bet actually going to be worthwhile? Kind of what hand classification am I in? And it can make your post-flop life a lot, lot easier. So let's look at another hand, one where we decide to raise with king-queen suited, get called by the cutoff. And at this point, we classify our hand strength, and at this point we're probably somewhere between a bluff and a semi-bluff. So let's say that we think it's valuable enough to go for a bet we think he's going to fold enough of the time, blah blah blah, I think it's good, so we go for it. He calls. King of the turn. So this is where a lot of people tend to get really just, oh well I have top pair so it's time for me to start betting. And again, we can't just bet because we have top pair, it needs to be more than that. What's our opponent going to continue with? How is he going to make mistakes? 
Let's say in this particular situation we thought our opponent would just never really make a calling mistake. He really only continue with any hands that beat us, so pocket tens, pocket fives, pocket threes, two pairs, whatever, and by that mentality the bet is kind of useless and not very good. So if I thought that my bet didn't do anything, again, I don't have value. At that point I probably have something closer to showdown value, and if that be the case I'd probably just check and try to induce, try to minimize, and try to go forward from there. So that's really the way that I would approach these situations. And if you thought that the call down on the riv was fine, then by all means go for it. If you thought he was bluffy enough that his betting range wasn't just hands that beat you, okay. And if you ever see this, definitely make sure you take a note that he will bluff, blah, blah, blah. So again, this is kind of the way you want to think about it. It's not just betting because you have top pair. It's looking at the entire situation, thinking about how your opponent's going to continue, and thinking about the kind of mistakes he's going to make. Sometimes you might treat a top pair hand as somewhere between value and showdown value against a aggro fish, but you think that the best way to make money is just by letting him bet at you. So you kind of just check call, check call, check call that can be a very, very valid strategy. So don't ever just bet because you have top pair. Make sure you're always thinking about it, thinking about the range that would continue, and also thinking about your opponent's mistake propensity, the kind of mistakes he makes. Is he really calling station-ish? Is he really aggressive? And making sure that you're taking lines that exploit him and maximize your value as best as possible. So that's going to wrap it up for this video. Again, we talked all about hand classifications, how to hand classify, and then also the kind of lines that we on average want to take and the kind of mindsets we want to take with each hand classification. The other thing to remember is that our hand classification does change throughout a hand. It can change based upon different textures on the turn and riv. It could change based upon different actions. So the way that we classify our hand is based on a wide variety of variables, also thinking about things like mistake propensity and what kind of mistakes our opponent is likely to make. So make sure that you're always being very fluid with your hand classification. Don't just classify it on the flop and think that it never changes because that's definitely not the case. So again, if you can work on classifying your hand strength well, classify it quickly, and also classify it in a way that you know how to take a line based on what your hand class is, I think that can definitely, definitely help you post-flop, can definitely put you in the right direction, at bare minimum get you started thinking about the right stuff post-flop. So same as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. Otherwise, best of luck out there, happy grinding, and good luck classifying your hands.